In the Christian story, God descends to reascend. He comes down, down from the heights of absolute being into time and space, down into humanity, down further still, if embryologists are right, to recapitulate in the womb ancient and pre-human phases of life, down to the very roots and seabed of the nature that he has created. But he goes down to come up again and bring the whole ruined world up with him. One has the picture of a strong man stooping lower and lower to get himself underneath some great complicated burden. He must stoop in order to lift. He must almost disappear under the load before he incredibly straightens his back and marches off with the whole mass swaying on his shoulders. Or one may think of a diver first reducing himself to nakedness, then glancing in midair, then gone with a splash, vanished, rushing down through green and warm water into black and cold water, down through increasing pressure into the death-like region of ooze and slime and old decay. Then up again, back to color and light, his lungs almost bursting till suddenly he breaks surface again, holding in his hand the dripping precious thing that he went down to recover. He and it are both colored now that they have come up into the light, down below where it lay colorless in the dark. He lost his color too. Anybody know what that's from? <laughs> Besides Roger? <laughs> that's C.S. Lewis in his book, Miracles, trying to describe for us the incarnation. I think it was, I, I don't think, I know, it was Karl Barth who said, it is not God alone that makes or fills out the meaning of the word of God. It is God and humanity. And Jesus is the word of God. For God and humanity unite into one person, one nature, 100% God, 100% man. So that Jesus is not just God's final word. He's God's best word. He's God's ultimate word. For he's God. But he's not just God. He's God and man at the same time, simultaneously. This is the beauty of that everyone who has preceded me so far this weekend has tried to point you toward, to draw you toward, praying for weeks beforehand, before they get here, that the Spirit would touch your heart and mine as it's touched theirs, that you could see, that you could behold the beauty the stunning revelation of who Jesus actually is. And stop arguing about how he did what he did, but realize that whatever he did, he did it. And it includes the entire human race. No one is left out of this, if to, to use language like this, I guess, plan. I hesitate because I don't think there was kind of a time where they made up a plan as though they didn't have one from eternity. They've always known what they would do. They've always known the love that they have for you. Knowing that we would reject it, knowing that we would not just reject it, but we would ridicule it, we would mock it, we would deny it. And they made you anyway. For there's nothing that you or I can do that can stop them from loving you. Nothing. 
Not anything you think, not anything you feel, not anything you do, no matter how long you live, there's nothing that you can do. There is nothing that you are that can keep them from loving you. That would be like you telling me that there's something that my child can do that would keep me from loving them. You can't. It's impossible. This was a crisis point for me in my life at one time because I realized that the theology that I had grown up with, the belief in God and the system or framework in which I understood God and life that was handed to me and that I was now in turn handing to young students was a theology that essentially taught me that I was a better father than God. For he did and was doing and would do things that I as a human being knew in the deepest part of who I was were wrong. Things that I would never dream of doing to my children. So if I'm an image bearer, a flawed one, a fallen one, a twisted one, a distorted one, but nonetheless, I am an image bearer. If the deepest part of me knows that this is wrong, how can I now say it's good because God does it? What, what kind of insanity is this? Can God who is good do the evil thing? Are, are we that twisted up that we sit and sing to him and praise to him and quote unquote try to live for him, this being who we say is good, but we're telling others that he does the evil thing? I call it, I call it metaphysical juggling, except we keep dropping the ball. And it was one of those times where I dropped the ball that I think the spirit, she just, as I came back up to start juggling again, she just stopped me. And just, you know, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm juggling. Because I'm trying to keep some kind of sanity in my life because you aren't safe for me. Whoa, 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 what did you just say? I don't know. Did I say that? <laughs> did I just admit that? That's another story for another time, but that's, that's, the, that's the place I found myself in. So, a few minutes ago, you listened to something that I would assume that most of us would describe as beautiful. It did something to you, not in an intellectual way, although it doesn't do it without your intellect, but you know that it was something that was touching you beyond just what you think just what your mind constructs. It was touching you in what we would say a far deeper place. A place where we think it's the real. That's what the incarnation did for me. It touched, that's the wrong word, it grabbed it tackled. It embraced me. And as I squirmed, I began to come to my senses, as it were, and see the stunning, absolute, unbelievable beauty of the one that was holding me. 
and then asking myself, why are you trying to get away? What is it that you're so, and here's the key, afraid of? Remember the verse that Brad read last night and that Paul read this morning? There is no fear in love. For complete love, perfect love, drives fear out. For fear has to do with punishment. I remember I was talking to a a group of uh, friends in a church. And it was a a community of people that um, believed that their salvation was graciously given to them because God, who demanded punishment, had satisfied that demand himself so that you wouldn't have to. And that was wonderful news for them. And I remember um, quoting 1 John 4 to them, knowing that they thought this, and knowing that my mind had changed, but they didn't know that. And I said, so fear drive, excuse me, love drives out fear because perfect love, sorry, there is no fear in love because perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. And so I asked them, then why do you believe God needed punishment to express his love to you? And I got some looks that were a little bit surprised. And I got some looks that were not so surprised, but they were angry. Now, what makes this really fun, Naya, where are you? I don't know if you remember this, but this was in slow. And Matea was translating for me. And I didn't know how Matea had translated it. I knew Matea. I knew she would say what I was saying. I but I didn't know the, if the exact words carry over. But when I saw their faces, I did. Because all of a sudden, it's like, what, what are you saying? And it's almost like you, again, I'll, I'll speak from personal experience. For me, as I began to question and struggle with these things, it almost felt like, I was betraying a heritage, something that my parents had given me, something that those who had loved me and taught me and cared for me had given me. And so I wasn't just betraying an idea, I was betraying people and a heritage. And I was betraying, according to the the framework that that I had believed, I was betraying God. That's no small crisis for someone that's 50 years old who has vested his entire life in the way that he sees God. That's a pretty big one. Because what happened was I, the beauty of seeing who Jesus is was something that I wouldn't let go. And at some point, I finally said, I am going to go after this, no matter what it means. Because this is so far, so beyond, so much more, that's great English, John, beautiful than anything that I had ever studied, believed, or taught. I think that there's some of you in here that have been on that same road, that same journey. And we struggle trying to articulate it. We hurt when those we love get angry and accuse us of having betrayed the heritage, the faith. And it almost wants us to 
stay in the us-them mentality except on the other side. But Jesus came to blow that up. There is no us and them. There's just us. Because not only are every one of us a victim, every one of us is a victimizer. So justice can't just solve the problem for the victim. It has to solve the problem for the victimizer in order to be justice. I'm both, and so are you, and so is every human being on the planet. So what I'd like to do tonight for a few moments is I I want to spend some time thinking about the Incarnation. And first thinking about maybe what it's not um, often helps me in actually thinking about what it is. And again, bad English. I said it. No. It's not an it. I remember very clearly, how many of you have seen the movie Invasion of the Body Snatchers? Doesn't matter, old version, new version. Really? Ken, you never saw Invasion of the Body Snatchers? Oh, man. It's a great one. Leonard Nimoy was in that movie. Spock, you know, remember? Um, The way I used to understand the incarnation, and I'm embarrassed to tell you how old I was before this changed, but the way I used to understand the incarnation, and I don't blame this on anybody because I don't consciously remember anyone actually teaching me this, And I don't know how I got it, but I do know that it's what I thought. I used to think that the incarnation was kind of like, you have this empty pitcher. And I think I remember someone using this as an illustration. And I think that's, that's kind of what stuck. Took an empty pitcher and then had this other pitcher of water. And as they were pouring the water into the empty of the picture, they said, God took on human flesh. God entered a human being. Obvious that the empty picture here was representing you and me, human beings, and God was the water being poured into it. So God just kind of filled up and dwelt a human body. And so when Jesus said things and taught things, that's God teaching those things. And when he did miracles, that's God doing those miracles. And when he taught, that's God teaching. And when he comforted or embraced other people, that's God doing that. And the answer is yes, it is. But for me, it was like God did that and he, because there wasn't any humanness, it was just a body that God had filled up. It was a shell that he'd filled up. That's invasion of the body snatchers. So God's moving these human lips and God's moving these human fingers and God's firing the electronic impulses in my brain and secreting the chemicals in my body to get the muscles and organs to do what they're supposed to do. He just filled up a shell. But you see, God didn't indwell a human body He indwelled a human being. So yes, God did all all those things. But it was man. It was a human being that did all those things at the same time. Well, which part of them did it? Both. Because they're inseparable. Because it's not an equation. It's a union. It's not like... Here's a circle, and this is mankind, and here's another circle, and this is divinity, and they overlap, and right there in that intersection, that's the incarnation they kind of know. It's here's man, and then there's another circle laid exactly on top of it, and here's divinity. They're one and the same. It's not God alone. 
that comprises the Word of God. It is God and man that make the Word of God. He is the final word. He is the best word. He's the ultimate word. He's Jesus of Nazareth. The writer of Hebrews says it this way. In the past, God spoke at various times and in various ways through the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son, who is his final, last, and best word. Why? Because he's God. Indwelling human flesh. So, what is the incarnation? Well, it's the enfleshment of God. It's God taking on flesh. And we don't mean flesh as simply human. You've heard several people refer to this. We, when, we, when John says the word became flesh, which is such a mind-boggling statement, he, I, th- I believe he's referring not to Adam like he was before he fell, but to Adam like he was after he fell. So what is this enfleshment? Well, what it's not, we'll start. You know, I'm going to read this from here. You can read it up there. Because actually, Jeff, it's big enough that I can read. How about that? It's not a feeble attempt by the Creator to communicate with His creatures. I can't tell you how many times I used to try to explain the Incarnation to people like, well, it's like if, if you were an ant and God was you, and you wanted to communicate with the ant, you'd become an ant and you'd, you know, communicate. That's what the Incarnation is. That's why I did it. That's not what this is. The Incarnation is not like the mythological Zeus calling down fire on our, on our stupidity or secretly visiting the planet cloaked in the shell of a human body to provide or thwart the endeavors of its children. I've seen enough movies. I've read enough books. I'm familiar enough with Greek mythology to know that God's not like Zeus and he's not like Jupiter. Deities who arbitrarily do whatever they feel like doing, which isn't always very good, you know, divine prerogative, you know? That's not the incarnation. It's not God uh, fulfilling a God-ordained external moral or legal obligation that God meets for his creatures because they can't. Again, what kind of insanity is that? It's the Father, Son, and Spirit in in the communion of their community from all eternity, and they're saying, let's make some creatures and let's establish some rules that we know that they'll break, and then let's go down and we'll become one of them so that we can do what they couldn't do, and that's what this is all about, just to show them that we can do what they can't do. And then they'll praise us. It's not a perfect representation of God like a reflection we see in a mirror, a painting, or a photograph that only resembles the divine but falls pathetically short of God's substance. This is another place where I fell often because of the words and what I, the meaning that I attach to the words that I read even in Scripture. That Jesus is the exact likeness of the Father. Oh, that sounds like the mirror reflection. The problem is the mirror reflection isn't the real It's just a reflection. And even if it's a perfect reflection in the way that it looks, it's still not the real. It's just what it looks like. And the incarnation isn't just to show us what God looks like. It's God himself. It's not a man who was so in tune with the spiritual consciousness of the divine in him that he lived in a perfect God-like way. I have several friends who have entered this journey with me of change. And received and bathed in the beauty of who God was. And realized the truth of their being. 
but they went far past that because now the truth of their being is the truth of their being without Jesus. And ladies and gentlemen, that's impossible because you didn't create you. The truth of your being is the truth of your being because Jesus made you. And what they've done is when they get there, they have to look at Jesus because they, they know that he's unique. They know that he's different. They know that he's amazing. But he's just this man that has reached this level of consciousness that we all can eventually get to if we would just go through the spiritual dis- disciplines or the meditations or whatever it is that we need to do because we're God too. And I go, you know, that's all I kind of there with you, but when you say it doesn't, like Jesus isn't in this, and he's just, as Ken mentioned, my favorite comic book when I was a kid, he's not just Superman. I can't go there. I, am, I imagine Jesus is Superman. You know, that when, <laughs> when the woman at the well comes, you know, he's cloaked, He's Clark Kent, and he has this conversation. And then when she says, you know, I know the day is coming, you know, when, you know, this is going to happen. And Jesus, Jesus says, well, the one who speaks with you is him. And he bursts open, and there's the big red G, right? And I just, I imagine it must have been exhausting for him, you know, rushing in and out of the phone booth a million times a day. God, man, God, man, God, man, God, man, God, man. You know, because to brush my teeth, I don't need to be God. I can do that, right? But, you know, to teach the woman at the well, I need to be God, <laughs> right? I mean, this is, this is the dilemma that I find myself in because my mind can't wrap itself around the idea that he's God and man simultaneously. And it's not two persons. It's not two natures. It's one. And in the breath of a word, we just entered into mystery. <laughs> so now let... Let's take our, ourselves and bend our theological knees. Would you do that with me? Because we're talking about Jesus. And he's more beautiful than anything. Than anything. I'm a photographer by vocation. This is not a shameless plug for my book. For the last 30 some years of my life, my job has been to go into nature and find the most beautiful places I can and find the beauty there and try and image it, capture it. I'm a purist. I don't use Photoshop. I don't manipulate. I don't use digital. I shoot film. I don't use filters. It is what it is. That's my plug for photography. But anyway... I have seen I wish that I could somehow roll a movie not of everything I've seen (laughs) we don't want to go there but I do wish that we could roll a movie of some of the things that I have seen in nature I was in the southernmost part of the country of Chile, in a place called Torres del Paine National Park. It's where the Patagonia ice cap, which is the largest ice cap on the planet other than the North and South Pole, it's where it ends. And I had, uh, to get there, it's way, it's too damn long. <laughs> It just takes a long, long time to get there. Plane rides, bus rides. And these are bus rides not like, you know, these are bus rides on a school bus with chickens and, you know, it's just, it's rural, if you can even call it that. It's on gravel roads and you get to the entrance of the park and it's a little trailer. Kind of like the entrance to Grand Canyon National Park. Not. Um, And I'd been there for four days and I had experienced almost... Uh, every kind of weather that you can experience. I didn't, I didn't have any tornadoes, and we didn't quite have a hurricane. It felt like it. But we had snow, we had sleet, we had hail, 
We had lightning and thunder. We had wind that almost knocked us over. We had everything but clear, bright, sunny days. And I'd been there for four days and four nights, and I literally had not taken one photograph. Now, you, again, you have to understand how much money and time and efforts involved just to get there. To be there for four days without taking a photograph, even at my best moments, that's a little bit discouraging. On the fifth day in the afternoon, it started to clear. And uh, I started to see the glacier, where the gray glacier that comes off the cap. And... Um, it was, it was like, it was spectacular. But I had hiked at that point, I had hiked about 10 miles into the mountains. And I knew that the best photograph was coming out of the mountains, was to get out of the mountain group so that I could look back at the whole photograph, at the whole scene. And so I would, the friends I was with, I was actually with Michael Scholl's brother, who's here. His brother's name's Eric. I was with Eric and a few friends. And I told him, I said, look, if it clears, I need to get out of the. Uh, I need to get out of here. I need to get hike back so I can get out of the mountain group, so that I can take this photograph. And um, he said, "Okay." So we we made a plan of how we do that. Sure enough, the next morning there wasn't a cloud in the sky. Sixth day, not a cloud in the sky. And actually, we met up with some guys from Stanford University that were working on their PhDs in geology had been studying down there for four months, and they said, this is the best day we have seen since we've been here. (laughs) So I'm really glad I didn't get there when they did. Um, So we we hiked out, and we got out, and the the arrangement was um, that they would take the tent, they would take the stove. I had a little bit of food. I had my sleeping bag, and it was easy for me because I could get back to the one dirt road that goes through the park, and I, where, I, where I knew the photograph was, I could just throw my sleeping bag down on the ground and be there for first light in the morning to shoot the image. And, um, and there was actually one place where I could actually buy something to eat. It wasn't very good, mind you, but I could get something to eat if I needed it. So we separated, we parted. And um, I get there and I'm walking down this dirt road, and I have this big pack. I've got about 60, 65 pounds on my pack, and I've got this huge tripod sticking out the side. And a car comes down the road, and as uh, I turned to look, and as it was approaching me, I could see the passenger side window start to come down. I don't know if it was a she. I don't know if she was rolling it or if it was, you know, battery or whatever. But uh, the window comes down, comes to a stop, and she says in a very European German accent, which I can't imitate. Are you a photographer? So my Philadelphia humor just wanted to go, no. Why would you ask that? Oh, this big tripod? No, that's what I sleep on. No. So, but I didn't. I was very polite and I said, yeah, I am. And they said, oh, can we hang out with you? I said, okay, will you give me a ride wherever I want to go? Sure. Okay, we got a deal. So I spent the next about eight hours with this German couple, taking them around, giving them a private tutorial lesson on nature photography. I figured that's worth a lot of money. So we get, it's getting dark, and they said, so where are you sleeping? And I said, well, actually, I was only about a mile away from where I was going to just, I'm putting my sleeping bag down on the ground because I know that the photograph that I want is first light. And uh, so that's where I'm going to be. And they said, oh, well, we're staying in this little refugio. That's, a, that's like a hostel. And uh, it's like, I don't know, it was like $9, $11, something like that. And they said, oh, yeah, you can get a hot shower. You can get a bed. Because these are things I haven't had for six days. Okay? So, again, th- this isn't dangling carrots in front of me. This is dangling my wife's hot chocolate chip cookies right out of the oven in front of me. Like, who's going to say no to that, right? So I hop in the car and I go with them. Problem is, it's about 11 miles away from where I want to be the next morning. So I say to them, I said, before we got in the car, I was smart enough to do this. Before we got in the car, I said, okay, I'll do that if you promise that you'll bring me back here tomorrow morning. Oh, yeah, we want to come with you. We, we know that 
you're, you know, you're the photographer. We want to be here. Get this shot. I said, okay, great. So we get there. I check in, give them my whatever. Well, I don't even know what the currency is in Chile. But uh, I, anybody know? What's, what is it? I don't know. Anyway, I've got extra in my drawer just in case I ever go back there someday. Uh, but um, I start going to my room. They're going to theirs. And she gets to the door and she's going in and he turns around and comes back and says, John, he says, you know, we've been thinking about it and I don't remember her name. Let's call her uh, Heidi. That's a German name. And <laughs> Heidi's not feeling really good. She's really tired and she doesn't want to get up at five in the morning to go get that picture. So we're not going to go. <laughs> oh, you're, oh, oh, come on. You know, you need to ratchet that up at about a thousand percent. Yeah. It, it's, it's worse, man. We've got some explic- explicatives in there, right? Not to him, just going through my head. Like, you have to be... Get, what, what so I, I pull my wallet out. I pull my passport out. And I say, look, um, I will, you, can, you can have these. You can keep these if you would let me use your car to just go get that photograph. Because this is what I've come here for. I've waited for this. We're now on the verge of a week, and this is it. And I know it. And so if you'll just let me use the car, I will come back. This is proof. I've got to come back and get my passport and my money, or I I can't get out of the country or whatever, you know. And he thought about it for a second. He said, no, you know, I said, I'd love to, but I can't, because if anything happens, your insurance, he said, I don't even know what would happen. And I said, and he was right. I said, okay. So I went back in the room, and I was pissed. I wasn't pissed at them. I was pissed at God. And I was pissed at myself. Like, okay, all because you wanted a shower. All because you wanted a bed. If you just stuck with the plan, you'd be there. You'd be asleep in your bag, under the stars. You've done it a million times. It's wonderful. And so now, you know, there's the self-loathing. All that's going on. But then I turn it on God. Like, hey... What the, like, you, you knew what I was doing. You knew what was going on. You got me here. You gave me the perfect weather. Like, why didn't you just kind of say, don't go there? Like, how hard's that? How hard's it to say, no, you really need to stay here? I mean, you know, I realize it's foolish, but it doesn't matter. I was, I was angry. So, I start packing up my backpack, take a shower. I did take a shower. And uh, about 1.30 in the morning, I started walking. Sun came up right around 6. And about 5.30, about four hours later, I'm still at least a couple miles away. And you say, you couldn't do that in four hours? Okay, seriously, you want to talk about that? (laughs) I had 65 pounds on my back. It's the middle of the night and I haven't slept. So no, I couldn't do that in four hours. And anyway, it's about 5.30 and you know how it gets before the sun comes up. Light's coming in and I can see the peaks and it's amazing. There are these wispy clouds just hanging in front of the peaks and everything else is blue. And I'm thinking, I'm not going to make it. There's just no way I can make it. About 15 minutes later, I think, I don't remember exactly, a car starts coming up the road. And I stood in the middle of the road like this. I'm I'm not, this is literally not an exaggeration. I stood in the middle of the road because I'm either going to get run over or he's going to stop. But what's not going to happen, he's not going to drive past me as though I'm not there. That isn't going to happen. Because as as far as I know, this is it. This is my one shot if they'll let me get in the car that I might at some outside chance get there in time. So obviously he stopped. I'm still here. I didn't die. And uh, he rolls down his window and he's a German. Another freaking German. I don't want to see another German. So (laughs) And I said, hey, can 
can you just give me a ride just like a little bit up the road? I'm trying, I'd love to take a picture of the sun. I'm trying to get there. Sure. It's a pickup truck. So I throw my backpack in the back of the truck. I jump in and he takes off. We get there and I said, oh man, thanks so much. As I'm getting out of the door, almost like kind of impolite. I'm sorry, I'm in a hurry. I get my backpack, I throw it on and I start running. And I run, it's maybe, I don't know, I'm going to guess maybe a football field and a half, maybe 150 yards to, a, to the edge of a lake where now I have an unobstructed view with a lake that's reflecting these peaks that are turning gold with these wispy clouds hanging, almost like it looks like it's Narnia. I'm not kidding. Yeah. You don't have to buy the book. You can, go, you can go see the photo I'm talking about in the book, okay? But you just let the cat out of the bag. No, no, okay. It's okay. It's just a book. Wait, wait, look, look. It's the Bible. <laughs> so... <clears throat> I got to hurry. I'm almost out of time, and I, I literally haven't started what I wanted to talk about. So, <laughs> it's true. It's true. Anyway, so I get there, and uh, it's a top loading pack, so I'm pulling everything because when you, the way you back, pack a backpack is you put your heaviest stuff at the bottom to carry it on your hips. So, where's my camera? Okay, my camera is a four by five, which is a view camera. You get under a cloth, you put plates in it, weighs about 18 pounds, okay? With a lens and all that, it's like 24. It's down at the bottom of the pack. So I'm literally pulling everything out of my pack, get my camera, put it on the tripod, set it up, and now the, the sun is hitting the peaks, and it's, it's been up for a couple of minutes so that redness is starting to fade. It's becoming more gold, more yellow. But it's okay. It's still flat out the coolest thing I've ever seen. And I focus. I light meter. I set the lens. I set the aperture. Close the shutter. Put it in. Pull the slide out. Click. Put it back in. Turn the holder around. Put it back in. Pull it out. Click. Put it in. And I'm done. And then I sat there and I wept. I wept because I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I couldn't believe that I got a photograph of it. I just couldn't believe anything. It was surreal. Because here's the thing, guys. On that day, it was in March. I don't even remember the year. But on that day in this universe, there was one person who saw that only one it was me me and the father and the son and the spirit that saw that nobody else it was a private show it was beauty that just blew me away and I got a photograph of it and yeah it's on the cover of the book more beautiful than that, more infinitely beautiful than that, is the incarnation. I, I, you know, I am so there with Baxter when he says the day is going to come when we're going to read some passages in Scripture and we won't be able to read them without weeping. Not out of guilt or shame, but because we're just so overwhelmed with the beauty, the truth, the real of what it is that we're engaging, that we're confronted with. The day is going to come when not only in my mind's eye, I will see him face to face, but I will engage him in the flesh face to face. Because forever there now stands in the inner circle of the triune life 
a man. And vicariously, all men. The entire human race. You are not outside looking in, gawking at how beautiful they are. You are in the circle. You and I are in the being of God. For the incarnation takes place within the being of God. It's not some external thing that God does. It's him in his being that he takes on flesh. And he took it on not like a coat that he's going to take off someday later. It's not some kind of cosmic deistic bait and switch. He's not a used car salesman who's trying to get you to buy something and then he's going to show you what he's really like after you do. He's now man, forever man, standing at the right hand of his father, face to face, in the onto being, in the ontological reality that God is. God is now man, and you are in him. Why? Why would you want to go past that? Why would you want to leave that behind? I don't know. What I do know is that I'm not going to. I, at this point in my life, I hold most of it very loosely. And I I say it like, is that a one finger, two finger, three finger, four finger hold, right? Or is it like a death grip? Right? The incarnation's a death grip. And that's the wrong word because death has been abolished. It's been blown up. But it's a grip that, you know, I'm on. But here's the cool thing. It doesn't matter how strong I am holding on. He's holding on to me. He's got me. It's not like I somehow squirmed in him. He's in me. And he put me there in him. Okay? Okay? forever. Now, I don't know whether you like that or not. I think you do, but here's the thing. You can't do a thing about it. You don't have a vote. It's what he's done. God loves you. Thank you, Roger Newell, for this. I'm going to steal this from you, but it's not yours. It's passed on from generation to generation, century over century. But God loves you and I just as we are. He doesn't say, clean yourself up, get your act together, and then I'd love you. I love you just as you are. But I also love you so much that I won't leave you there. I don't know how to end what I want to say better than a quote from George MacDonald. If a human being, and I just changed that, sorry, George, because he says a man. If a human being, man or woman, will not come out of his sin, he must suffer the vengeance of a love that would not be love if it left him there. His love for you and I is finally and ultimately, and forever settled. Because it's the way he always has been and always will be. And it's settled in a way that says, you are the apple of my eye. You are the one that I love. Is that good news? Amen.